A couple of years ago, I picked up the book, How to Write Funny and Outrageous Marketing. It's written by this man named Scott Dickers, who is a comedian and writer and the founder of The Onion, the world's most reliable news source. I love that through his books and his training, he has lifted the veil for aspiring writers and undercover creatives on the science behind not only making your writing funnier, but also how to manage and market your creative career. I got to sit down with Scott and ask him about the tension between needing to let ideas simmer, but also needing to produce, and how to cultivate these feedback groups that Scott advocates for when you're an introverted workaholic. I don't know nothing about all that. This, my friends, is the one and only Scott Dickers. Too many creatives work in solitude, and then they present their work, and it flops, and they're like, well, what did I do wrong? Well, you didn't test it. The first step is to come up with as much bad ideas as you possibly can. Bad ideas. And my God, if something goes through that process on the individual level and then on the group level and then on the public media level, ideas that uh, come out the end are going to be really, really good ideas. Scott Dickers, I have had you on my guest wish list. Oh. For a couple of years now, a couple okay. of years, I've read a few of your books. Mm. I'm very interested in your work. I would call myself a newbie writer, and I'm interested in comedy just because I'm interested in it. So I'm really jealous when I run across people like you who have such a knack for things and have built an entire career around something I want to get better at. But one of the things you advocate for and what I'm so grateful you came on the show to do is you believe this stuff can be taught and learned. And there's hope for Heather Parody after all. So Absolutely. Scott, I've got a bunch of questions for you, but thank you for agreeing to come on. It is my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. I've had people on my podcast guest wish list for years, so I know what you're talking about. It's a <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. That's right. I want to start off your book, How to Write Funny, the very, very beginning. I'm going to do what Oprah does and read you a little bit of your own book. Right. Read you a little bit of it. But it says here, when I first got interested in writing humor, I was terminally unfunny, crushingly shy, and always the least charismatic person in the room. And that's shocking to hear that because when you went on to build the platforms you've built to write the books and all the things you're saying when you were younger, you were shy, unfunny. I want to hear a little bit about who that young man was. Yeah, well, it's funny. Earlier you said that you admire someone who has a knack. And I don't really believe in knacks anymore. I think everything in life is a skill and we have to dedicate ourselves to learning each skill because we all come out of the womb pretty skill-less. You know, we can, literally, some of us can't even eat. So yeah, you got to learn this stuff and you got to go through the, the process of learning it. So why do some people learn how to do comedy really well? Why are some people funny? To answer your second question about like, who was I as a kid? You know, I, I was a really sad kid. I came from a, a sad people, like a, a very like stone-faced Puritan stock. And there was not a lot of joviality in the home. Parents didn't really have any friends, didn't really have any like life in the home, except for TV, you know, maybe me and my brothers goofing around. The structure was very serious. So I, like many people who learn the skill of comedy, discovered that it was a way to generate some of that like life and some of that, you know, passion in the world. So mm -hmm. making people laugh felt really good. I would draw little pictures. I would write little stories, make little booklets, and I would give them to my grandma or show them to my mom. And they would just be delighted. And this was a, this is a very early sign I was getting from my surroundings that Hey, this is a this is a way to live. It's a lot better than the way than the sad way you've been living. So, you know, it it didn't help that I was like, you know, like I said in that little passage shy. I was really small and my parents got divorced. Our dad used to give us crew cuts and after he left, our mom let us grow our hair. So I had hair like down to here 
and I wore literally rags. I looked like a homeless waif. And I probably weighed, you know, 65 pounds as a, as a 10 year old. And so, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a commanding presence, <laughs> you know, I was very, very easily dismissed and never the center of attention. And so I was lonely, you know, and comedy like solved all those problems. Suddenly I was interesting. I was fun to be with and I had power, like, you know, I could, make fun of things and people would laugh and they're like, Oh, he knows something, you know, and unconsciously I pursue this skill, you know, for the next, you know, 20, 15, 20 years of my life without realizing I'm building a skill. You know, I try to make jokes in class. I, I keep making little projects. I make little movies. I make little audio, you know, skits. I do it. I do it all. Like I'm a, I'm a, a Renaissance comedy performer. All of it's terrible. Like none of it's really that, that good. Grandma still liking it, you know, which is great. But on rare occasion, like some, you know, real audience, like a kid in school who doesn't like me, you know, would actually find something I did funny. And that was an achievement. That's like a stand up comedian going to, you know, in front of an audience of total strangers and trying out some jokes and having one actually work, you know, yeah. it's like a big achievement. So according to Malcolm Gladwell, if you do something obsessively for 10 years, you're going to end up being a, an expert. You're going to be a master at that. It took me about 15 or 20, but I started doing comic strips and helped start up this newspaper called The Onion when I was in my early 20s. Hmm. And I, I felt like I knew comedy. I felt like I knew what I was doing. And the stuff worked. Like it really did well. And I parlayed that into doing a lot of other things. I kept doing the same stuff I've been doing my whole life. Now I was actually trying to make money at it. It's a long answer around. When did you start taking yourself seriously and your creativity seriously? This wasn't just some way to connect with people and feel good right. and it's just interesting, but this was actually your path. Yeah, that would have been probably late in my senior year of high school. That's early. The, was, yeah. That's early, early man. It was the reality of, all right, I'm going to move out of my mom's house and I got to make a living. Yeah. I tried to get a job in the small town where I grew up. It's a town of like 2000 people in Wisconsin. There were no jobs because my older brother had a job at the town grocery store and got fired for being late. So my name was poison in the town and I couldn't get hired anywhere. Mm. So... I was like, well, the only skill I have is comedy. I have to figure out how to somehow make a living doing comedy. And so the cheapest, quickest, easiest way, the most down and dirty way to do that for me was comic strips because they're cheap to produce and you don't need a lot of materials. You don't even need experience. You just draw some comics and you send them to a newspaper and then hopefully they'll pay you to run them. And so I tried doing that for about four or five years and I got a job at McDonald's and I, I worked other like minimum wage, you know, temp, anything just to pay the bills. And I lived, you know, I, I was paycheck to paycheck, yeah. poor person trying to make it in comedy and just sending out comic strips. And after like four or five years, I started selling some comic strips and I knew the real secret was not like gag strips for like the New Yorker. I, my sites were so low. I never even sent comics to, to the New Yorker or any like big organization like that. However, I did send them to the newspaper syndicates because what I wanted was I wanted to get my comics in as many newspapers as possible because I knew that's how you made money at it. Each newspaper would pay you $5. So I started sending them to newspapers directly and I got in a few like alternative, you know, small weekly newspapers. And then when I failed to get any traction with the big syndicates, I, I sent a comic to the college newspaper in Madison, Wisconsin, where I had moved to. And it was pretty accessible. Like you go into the office, you could meet the graphics editor. And I came up with an idea for a comic strip and I submitted it and he didn't really like it, but he was willing to run it on a trial basis. What he didn't realize was I, I had been doing cartoons for like six, maybe years at that point. I was pretty sure I knew what I was doing. And the comic didn't look like much. It was stick figures, but I, I knew it was something. And he ran it and it really caught fire fast and people mm. really liked it. And it became a, a real hit on campus. 
I made t-shirts that sold at a local store and like kids around campus constantly, you'd see them wearing the t-shirts. I put out a book of collected strips. I self-syndicated it to other college newspapers. I basically was like, I wasn't going to let anybody tell me you can't have a syndicated comic strip. I was going to do it myself. So doing that comic strip led to meeting the two guys who started up The Onion and getting involved with them from issue one, basically just like doing as much as I could for them. And then a year later, they sold it to me and I became owner editor of The Onion. And so, yeah, I was, I was probably five or six years into that point at which I started taking it seriously to actually making money at it. I like that you brought up the term obsession. I'm going to bust out Outrageous Marketing, another one of your books. Towards the end, you talk about creative passions. You said, I always found when I pursue my creative passions obsessively, like-minded people are drawn to me as if by gravity. And wish you could see my little stick figure face that I drew next to that a couple of years ago, but it's like, I was like creative obsession, pursuing your creative passions obsessively. And I'll tell you, I, I know you know this and believe this and preach and teach it. When you are a creative person, you're a business person too, because you've got to figure out how to get your work out there. Sorry, folks. It's the truth. And yeah. figuring out when there are signs that you are either in the wrong path or you need to adjust because what you're doing is not working versus having relentless, relent, relentlessness, relentlessness. That's a freaking hard word versus being relentless and buckering down, you know, living minimally, passing newspapers out in the street. How have you gauged that as a creative when sometimes you need to shift versus you need to buckle down and get more stubborn? I've never had a problem with that doing comedy because I always knew that I wanted to do comedy and I probably could have kept doing it my whole life and never gotten good at it. And I would have still enjoyed myself doing it as a hobby because I love and need to do it so much. The only time I've run into what you're talking about is when I've pursued some skill or some endeavor that isn't as deep a passion for me as comedy, but that I still wanted to do. I might get really far into it and feel like, you know what, I'm just, I'm never going to achieve that obsess obsessive level of passion. So I'm either just going to remain as a hobbyist in this, or I need to really buckle down and do it. And some of those things I, I did buckle down and do it. And I, I had minimal, you know, some success, but I'm a big believer in like sticking with it if you like it, because what's the point of living if you're not going to do what you like? Like if you can never break through or make a living at it or make a big splash, whatever that means, who cares? Like you're, you're having fun, you're doing it, you're doing your thing. Just don't, you know, spend all your money. Don't go bankrupt doing it. Make it sustainable. Uh, I got no problem with that. Does that make any sense? Totally. Totally. And let me go a little bit deeper here than with this timeline of your story. So the onion took off <laughs> is a little bit of an understatement. And it actually became your world, your life. And I know you were involved with it in and out over like 30 years, something like that. Something and like you've that. pursued a lot of other creative endeavors, um, ended up writing this incredible book series that I love. It's so helpful. So thank you for writing that You're courses, welcome. educating folks, looking back at this high level over your career, are you grateful, happy that you kind of pursued multiple different pieces of creativity and didn't pigeonhole yourself? Or looking back, do you wish you would have gone in deeper with one thing? And the reason I ask this is I'm very multifaceted. You know, I'm, I'm a writer. I do content. I have a podcast. I'm writing a short film. I like photography. You know what I mean? Like I'm bit by the freaking bug, dude. And the common advice from entrepreneurs and branding and marketing folks is like, well, damn girl, you better niche down or you're not going to see any traction. And yeah. maybe I'm rebellious, but I just revolt against it. But seeing how many things you've done in your career, I'm curious, looking back, is that something that you glad you nurtured? Yes. I don't have any regrets. And it's so funny. I'm so obsessive about so many things and I enjoy doing so many things that the few little niches that I've like explored, I tend to have a hard time finding people who have done as much work in that niche as I have. So even the things that are like tertiary interests for me, <laughs> I've, I've built quite an expertise at. 
because I've pursued every passion and every interest. And I was really lucky with The Onion to, you know, and you mentioned that it, it took off big. That wasn't until a few years in, you know, we were struggling for the first few years. But once it was making money and a, a going concern and I had a team and I could delegate, I could go away and do other things, you know? So I made right. two feature films and I wrote other books that weren't like Onion branded books. I pursued this whole other career as a, a movie sound man. I, it's like a thing I don't really ever talk about or tell people about. It's such a, a weird little tangent, but I've always loved audio and I've loved radio drama and I love mm. doing post-production sound for movies. So I got work doing like Foley and stuff. And even in that little niche, like I'm so obsessive, like I still have volumes of tapes of sound effects that I've recorded that. I'm saving, you know, I might be able to use at some point, cool. but it's like this, you know, if I could live another life, like maybe I would have done that, but I feel pretty good about my choices. Like comedy is definitely the first one. Like, or if I had to just put it in one box, it'd be creativity. Like all this stuff is in that box and yeah. that's really my passion. So no, I, I really don't regret not drilling down. I hear what you're saying. Like uh, people do advise like, yeah, drill down, find your niche and stay in that niche or whatever. And I do that every time I think of something, I'll make a niche and I'll drill into it and I'll do that. And I'll, you know, I'll be pretty consistent at it. So I did my comic strip for 10 years and that's a pretty good run for a comic strip. You know, there's, that's no, yeah. uh, no shame in that. And I stopped doing it when I felt like I was done. Like I felt like, all right, I've, I've done that. I've done enough of it. I don't need to do that anymore. Good. Well, you made me feel better. I just had some therapy with you. Y'all hear that? Scott says that can be multifaceted. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah, I doing just, therapy was never one of my niches that I <laughs> Maybe it is now. Yeah, uh, it. I just finished this book. It's a really tiny book. It's called A Technique for Producing Ideas. And it's this old school journalist from like early 1900s. And he gives like a formula for generating ideas. And I wanted to give you his formula because I've been really interested in it. And, and if, you followed the same idea because I know the very beginning of how to write funny, you talk about the most important thing is a concept and right. we're gathering material constantly and we're putting it through some kind of filter. Like, is this something? And this dude back from like 1910, this was his five-step process. He said, before you, before you give me the process, I want to yeah. divulge that I am working on a book right now um, called creativity machine which outli lays out my process for creativity, how to come up with the best ideas. And it's a four-step process, and I call it the Ideatron 9000. It's a machine that generates absolutely the best ideas, and everybody should use it no matter what area you're in, within like a creative sphere or out. You know, It's a great way to come up with ideas. So I wanted to disclose that before you tell me what he said in his book, because now I want to compare his steps to mine and see. I was going to say, can you share those four steps or is it want, Yeah, I'll, I'll share mine. So this is interesting. This is yeah, really fun. Uh, the first step is to come up with as much bad ideas as you possibly can. Bad ideas. Throw everything at the wall, not just from yourself, but from other people, just like any idea, stream of consciousness. Okay. And then step two is vetting those concepts. How do you do that? That takes either setting them aside and forgetting about them and then coming back and looking at them yourself. But ideally, that's the, the poor person's way to do it. The best way to do it is to have a group or a team, people you trust to look at the ideas and give you feedback on them. And the third step is to finesse them. So take the ideas and workshop them. Make sure they're as tight as they can be. Like I'm talking about the winners that you selected in stage two. Yeah. You've got this short list of winners Make sure they align with your identity, your brand voice, whatever whatever you have. Finesse them, perfect them, et cetera. And then the fourth step is to put them out there, put them out in the world, test them with real audiences to see what kind of reaction you get from actual strangers who don't care about you because that's ultimately, that's the best test of ideas. And the ideas that pass through all those are the best ideas. Well, damn, I think I like that better than this dude's. I think he's passed away by now, so I'm not afraid of it. He's dead. James Webb what, Young. You know? What kind of idea is he going to have? <laughs> so, so this is what he had. He, it, I mean, essentially you said the same thing. Tell me where, where we're missing. He said, you gather material, you make new combinations, you take a break, the idea appears, 
and then you refine it. It's similar. It sounds like sort of a 1901 version of the Ideatron 9000 is what it sounds like. <laughs> this is the new and improved thing. Yeah, um, I think my, mine, is, mine is like the futuristic version of, of his. It's like, oh my God, a whole step for take a break? That's lame. You're going to do that if, if you don't have a team, if you don't have a feedback group, you do that yourself. I did mention that, like step aside from the idea yeah. to forget it so that when you go back, you're looking at it with fresh eyes. But if you live in the, if you live like a hermit in the woods, use that method. But if you have people around you, like that's so much more valuable to get input from other people. I'm glad you brought that up because we talked earlier about I'm an introvert. Yes, y'all, I am. You don't know me. I am. And then Scott here says he's even a step further. You're a recluse. And yeah. I'll tell you, friend, this is what has been my biggest one of my biggest hangups with the creative process is kind of that gathering feedback stage because I am so boring you would just throw up if you knew how boring I was in regular life I don't do a lot of new things I'm very you know I am a routine girl so gathering new stimulus and new information is very hard and I I don't really have a community a lot of, of us creators when we're in the content creation space you don't have a team you don't have people who will give you feedback besides that's real good heather keep it up which is kind you know what i mean but i yeah. get jealous hearing about writing writers rooms and all this these cool back and forth banter and pieces and maybe i'm just being a wow wow baby with excuses but how do you advise someone like me who makes her content right here by herself yeah. and has a freaking Google calendar of meetings, and then I'm going to eat dinner by six and be in bed at nine. I'm boring. Well, I can relate to that. I think it's, it's good to be boring. Like it's calming. You know, I have cultivated feedback groups and writer groups over the years that work for me. So we don't have to meet in person. We don't have to do the small talk or the chit chat because that's the really draining part of being with other people. The, oh, how have you been? What's new? You know, I'll set up a, a meeting with a friend maybe once every month or two to have that kind of conversation and it'll drain me. That'll be it for the day. You know, that's, that's my day. But with the writing, like we're on task, you know, we meet, yeah. we go through the stuff, we talk about it, I'm out. And so I have this group called the writer's room that are, is composed of former students, a lot of professionals and people who just pay to be in it. And we meet like about once a week and we go over stuff. And that's super helpful. I also have a Facebook group where people can post work and other pe members of the group will give feedback on the work, which is really valuable. And I use, I use both of them, primarily the Facebook group to just post ideas and see what people think, you know? So I, I need that. And I don't want to endure like the dynamics and the energy of being in a group of people live. Mm. That's too much for me. Yeah. So the writer's I mean, room, do, is that I something, do, do, sorry, go ahead. Is the writer's room something anybody could join? Is that open to the yeah, public? Yeah, anybody can join it. You sign up, you join. It's presently a steal at $10 a month, but I'm going to raise that to 25 a month soon. You should. Oh no, it's insane. $10 a month. I don't even know why I do it, but, and it is getting a little more crowded recently. So I had to get some help, you know, facilitating it, but well, we'll, you know, we'll figure it out. Yeah. You're we'll, going to see Heather in there now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're welcome. You're welcome to join. Anybody is. So That's the real awesome. trick now is is fitting everybody in, you know, fitting yeah. people in and we have to have time limits, you know. So our last meeting, it was four minutes to do your material and it could be written. People do stand up like it'd be anything. And then two minutes of feedback from nice. anybody in the group, including me. And then, but there's also the chat because you're on Zoom. So if people have notes or feedback, they can put it in the chat. Yeah, it's uh, people find it really helpful. And it's such an essential part of the creative process. You need that. Too many creatives work in solitude and then they present their work and it flops and they're like, why, well, what I do wrong? Well, you didn't test it. You know, you just, you had this blind belief that it would work and you put it out in the world without any tests. That's not, not a great, not a great process. Tell me more about the whole bad idea thing is this just so i can expand my consciousness and like allow more stuff in because i'm letting in bad with good because it, it seems counterintuitive that you're seeking out bad yeah. ideas i hear what you're saying and it's partly what you're saying it is to open your mind up you want there to be no limits at that stage 
you want to yes and everything in your mind. It's kind of like if you're mining for diamonds, you don't just dig a hole and pick out a diamond. You have to go through dirt and coal and rock. You got to lose an arm or, an, or a leg at times. So to get the gems of creativity, you got to go through the muck and you got to mm-hmm. just like plow through because you're never going to find the ideas otherwise. Like if you sat down and wrote one idea, very small chance that's going to be a great idea. But if you write a list of 20, I'll bet you I could go through that list and find one that's pretty good, you know? So it's just the way it works. Like you need that raw material. I have a pretty, I'm talking to you. I shouldn't say I have a strict schedule with putting out content because my God, (laughs) y'all had a strict schedule putting out content. That's helped I've, me though. I, I like having a strict schedule. Well, I let me get... talk to you about it because, okay, I, I put out, I, my, my goal is always to put out three original pieces a week of something. Pretty and good. so I have a process for mining. I s- sit down and write certain points throughout the week. And regardless, I just have to pick something and push it out. And I'll tell you more times than not, I think, damn, this could be so much better if I just pulled it a little more and waited but then you have the tension with that producer mindset where you have to show up and you want to be consistent so how do you reconcile letting something breathe and making it better versus sticking with production yeah that's a really good question and it really is a crux for the the perfectionist who's also a creative person part of it is embracing the idea of good not perfect and like doing your best and putting it out when it's time to put it out. And, you know, the second thing that you have to be good at is time management. And I am a notoriously poor time manager. So when I was doing The Onion and I'd be responsible for making sure that all the material was as good as we could make it before it went to press, I would be up all night, Saturday night, Sunday night, and we would put the paper to take it to the printer like at four in the morning, Mm. Sunday night. It would just be like an all nighter or an all weekender every week because there's just never enough time, you know? So you're doing your best, you're putting it out. And then you have to have faith that if you keep doing that over time, your ability to make it better in less time is going to improve. Right. So like, I'm like you, I do, I do a written post on Substack every day and I do five times a week social media posts, which are different Two are video three are, you know, something else. And then I also, in addition to that, I write books and I do other stuff. So thankfully I'm ahead on the social media. So I have time to look at it again and see if, okay, is this as good as it can be? You know, is it okay? Mm-hmm. But like for the, for the Substack, for example, occasionally I'll get a few days ahead, but it's really hard to get ahead on a daily thing like that. That's you know, incredible. God help me if, if I ever want to take a week vacation, <laughs> I'm going to have to write two a day for a while. But I have found, you know, I have a, a lifetime of experience writing, but just that little grinder that I signed up for to do a piece of writing every day of the week has made me a better writer because now I can make it better, faster, make it better with, with less time than I could before. And I look back in some of the posts and it's like, yeah, that could be better, but I don't beat myself up about it. Some of the posts I look back and say, it's pretty good, you know, and that's the best any creative person can hope for. Like I look back at you know, roughly 30 years of work on The Onion or my comic strip, whatever I want to look back on. And I see some work that it's like, ah, you know, it wasn't that great. And I see other work, it's like, oh my God, I was really on the ball then. And when it comes down to it, like, that's the best you can hope for is to have your best of be really great. You know, you're going to have some duds, you know, you're going to have some stuff that just didn't hit for whatever reason, even though you're putting it through that great idea machine, the Ideatron 9000. It's all micros and macros. So on the micro level, you're coming up with the idea, you're testing it, you're finessing it, you're putting it out there. But then you go, you step back and there's a macro level where you look at your entire body of work and think of that as the bad ideas. Okay, now go through and select the short list, the best ofs. You know, is there anything you can do to finesse those? Like, let's say you're going to collect them, put them in a book or something. Then you put that out into the world, you know? So there's all these different steps where that same process can be applied. And my God, if something goes through that process on the individual level and then on the group level and then on the 
public media level, ideas that uh, come out the end are going to be really, really good ideas. Is there a time where your intuition, you trust that over your group's feedback? So that's something that comes with time too. I think early on, it's safer to trust the group, but I'm a big believer, and this is how I always ran The Onion and how I advise anyone run any kind of comedy room or really any creative process. I, there has to be one person at the top who's like the benevolent dictator who can veto any idea and who can push through any idea that everyone else hates. That's really important. They should do that sparingly and they should generally agree with the majority of the group, but they need that option because otherwise the creative work that's produced feels very committee written and it feels very bland. You can't always trust the group. It's very much like in a real democracy in government. If you put everything to a vote, certain minorities would lose all their rights because the majority is not those people, you know? So you need some type of dictatorial power to say, no, 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 this 5% of the population really needs this thing. So we have to give it to them, even though nobody else wants it. So I, I would say it, it, it should be whimsical to answer your question. Like whether you go with your gut or the group, whimsical, you know, just do a, a check. Do I really think this is a great idea? Yeah, I do. Sorry. I think all you guys are wrong. I'm just going to put it out. What's the worst that could happen? It's not brain surgery. You know, worst could happen is it's not that great. And you were right. When, um, when you're in a, the, lar yeah. the larger goal achieved, sorry to cut you off. Okay. The larger goal to, to achieve at that point is that the larger body of work then feels to the audience like it's produced by some kind of intelligent vision. And that's very appealing. They like that. They want it to be a unique voice. They want it to be, because creativity and comedy in particular are really just communication. It's just you talking to people. It's you saying your ideas, saying what you think. It's you sharing your picture of the world. And on a fundamental level, people want to get that from another person. They want that connection. It's very like basic to being a human being and wanting just like human connection. If they feel like it's committee written or God forbid, like chat GPT written, they can smell it a mile away and they don't yeah. like it. It's, it yeah. feels very inauthentic and very fake. Can you dive in a little bit deeper what you meant by like a universal voice? Do you mean just collectively the writers in the room are all on the same page? Is it as simple as that? There's a group think that can take over any group. Mastermind. What's that? A mastermind, Napoleon Hill. I don't think of it as like a mastermind, but I like the mastermind group concept. I think that's a great thing. What I'm talking about is when there is a group of people and they all know each other and are familiar with each other, group think can, can take over. And that's a negative. So there's a lot of positives that come from a group like that. You get inspired by the others. And you know, that whole, I think maybe that also came from Napoleon Hill, that you become like the five people that you surround yourself with, you know, that whole mm -hmm. axis. So you get a lot of benefit from being around other really smart, creative people. But groupthink is bad. And groupthink is when people start to feel protective of the, the voice of the group and they don't want to take risks and they become, that's where the committee feeling comes in. It's like, oh, well, we don't want to offend anyone in the group. So if two people in the group hate this idea, we're not going to do it. That's bad. Sometimes it's good to put on an idea that two people in the group hate if the leader of the group thinks it's a really good idea because that's yeah. how you get that that's how you get that individual pure vision that the audience likes versus a committee driven product that the audience will tolerate and will think is perfectly good but it won't feel special to them. Interesting. How do you as the leader as someone who's facilitating this group shoot down ideas and maybe the same ideas are coming from the same person without killing that childlike creative freedom safety thing that people need to throw an idea out there. If you're just like, that ain't good, Paul, that's not good. That's not good, Paul, that's not good. How do you kind of balance that, I guess? There's a lot of little techniques. So you mentioned the book series that I wrote, the How to Write Funny book series. Mm -hmm. yeah. The third book in that series, How to Write Funniest, is all about how to be a, a leader of a comedy writer's room tons of techniques about how to deal with personalities, how to reject people, how to reject ideas. But I'll just throw a couple out here for you. So one is to make sure that you have created an environment where ideas can be talked about objectively. Not a good mm -hmm. idea. Good idea. 
Not a good idea. Good idea. And everybody needs to be on board with that. Second thing is to acknowledge that everybody has good days and bad days, good weeks, bad weeks. So at The Onion, people would show up with a list of ideas and let's say 20, 25 ideas, and none of the ideas make the short list, you know? And this is a professional comedy writer showing up and 0% of their work is hitting. And then maybe they do that a second week, third week in a row. And they're starting to get nervous. Like, oh my God, am I going to get fired? You know, some of these, like the Tonight Show used to have this 13 week contract for writers. If you weren't producing anything good in 13 weeks, you're out. But at The Onion, writers have worked there for years, you know, some of them for decades. And part of it was this cocoon of the writer's room that you were allowed to have off weeks and off days. And you could still be part of the group. You could still riff on other ideas. And so the worst that can happen is a writer comes to you in private and says, you know, that it's really hurting my feelings how none of my ideas seem to be working or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's a key like leadership moment where you have to communicate to the person that they're valuable, that they, their ideas are welcome to accept and embrace the fact that they, that everybody has off weeks and, you know, maybe take some ownership of it and say, yeah, I could have been less harsh, maybe the way I communicated that or whatever. It's making sure that they know that on some level they're respected. If you have that foundation, then you're actually going to be pretty good in the room just saying, nope, that sucks. Next, you know, and it's no big deal. Fourth thing, segment the idea approval process. So when you're in that first stage of ideas where you're just generating bad ideas, there's no bad idea. So you're not going to say to someone, that's a terrible idea. That's the wrong time to do that. You're, you're going to either say, yeah, I think that's pretty good. Or you're going to have an idea for how to improve it. You're going to yes and it, or you're just going to ignore it, move on to the next idea. And that's accepted. Everybody understands that the majority of the ideas are not going to be accepted. So there's no pressure. And then a different meeting on a different day or later in that day is when you're going through the short list and you're talking much more critically about ideas. And you're saying, well, I think this idea is good because of X, Y, and Z. Not so great because of, you know, ABC. So let's figure that out. Let's talk it through or whatever. That's where you can be a little bit more critical. In my book, I talk about the clown brain and the editor brain. Mm -hmm. The clown brain is like free, loves everything. It's like silly, irrepressible. That's the brain mindset that you want in that first meeting. But you want the editor brain in the second meeting where you're being really critical of the ideas and really judgmental and making sure that if they're going to pass through this final filter, they better be really good. Yeah. When you're in a stage where your ideas just are sucking and you're going through your process, you're showing up to the paper, you're doing all the things, but there's just like this lull. I have a freaking spreadsheet and it's called ideas and I just add to it all week. And then every Friday I go and I read through all my ideas and it's taking longer because I got more ideas every time. And I'll tell you, sometimes I'm like, damn, that's it. That's good. I know it. And more often than not, though, I'm like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. Yeah. And it's frustrating when a few weeks go by and you need to show up and like your ideas aren't popping. And I'm curious, like, what do you advise people or what have you done yourself when you feel like you're in a sucky idea season? How do you nurture that back? My really only advice for that is to do it anyway. Like do your best with it and put it out anyway. That is if you don't have time to like come up with something new, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's that process of making a bad idea work somehow, some way and meeting the deadline is really valuable. And it does teach you the skill of showing up and doing your best, which is ultimately all you have. Like that's the best you're ever going to do. So if you're in a lull, if you don't show up and don't do your best, if you just like don't do an idea that day, that that's real failure, you know? Yeah. So that'd be the main thing that I, that I would advise that another way to approach that is bring in some new blood, have somebody look at the list and tell you, you know, show them a list of 20 ideas that are terrible and tell them, do you see anything in there? Like, what do you see? And maybe they'll find one or two and they'll give you an angle on it that maybe does work better, yeah. you know? Other people are the greatest resource in creativity, especially in comedy. And a lot of creators don't realize that because it's a social endeavor. It's an interactive medium because the stuff doesn't work if people don't like it, <laughs> you know, yeah. other people have to like it. 
So you'd better test it with some other people or involve some other people in the generating of the ideas if you want any prayer of it working. So good. I wanted to ask you about hooks. I do short form video. That's my main focus right now. And I have kind of the conventional advice about developing a really solid hook at the beginning of a video. And I know, my God, the headlines that <laughs> you've written and has crossed your table. I'm guessing, tell me if I'm wrong on this, that there's probably a lot of similarities with like headlines versus like a hook for a video because both of them are wanting to capture someone's right. attention and make them curious to keep reading. And I know this is a big messy question, but high level, what are the best ways we should approach writing really good hooks, whether it's for a video or our written content? What questions do we need to ask ourselves? Well, you're not going to be surprised to hear the answer. And as you got to fire up the Ideatron 9000. I love the name of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got to shovel the bad ideas into the machine so they can churn them and pump out good ideas on the other end. Yeah, I'm new to hooks, like of hooks other than comedy. So the Onion headlines are hooks, but they're purely based on comedy. They're not using any other method of hooking. There's so many methods to hook people like yes. with you know, curiosity with like the unanswered question. There's all these things you can do. Comedy is probably the hardest one to do because basically what you're asking people to do is, okay, if you find this headline funny, please start reading the article. That's the only job of the, the onion headline. Please start reading the article. And I know from reading like the heat maps of, you know, users on the onions website that roughly 85% of people don't get past the first paragraph of the story, you know? And so when I would work so hard to make these stories as funny as possible and I would make them build. So the more you read, the funnier it got. It, it was disheartening to know that only 15% of people were reading to the end. Yeah, but That's just the world we live in. We live in a very short attention span world. Plenty of people want to just read the onion, look at the funny headline and go on with their day. Great. No, I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. It's like they've gotten this nugget, you know, they, they passed on getting more. That's fine. So I guess I would think the same way about any kind of hook, you know, so I, I write novels now and I, I, I find that like hooking people to read the next chapter, like what's the cliffhanger at the end of the chapter is really fun to experiment with. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's try a bunch of ideas, see what works. And that I, I really have no additional science behind it. There are plenty of people who train that sort of thing and are experts at hooks. But I think even those people, and I've taken a couple of those courses, even some of those people, you know, they don't really have a formula because you can't really say the same thing. There are certain patterns online. Like for a long time, we saw this thing like, here's a list of the seven things. You won't believe number two, you know? And so, and now we're on to something different. Now we're on to, I did insert this kind of weird, crazy experiments experience. And I can't believe what happened as a result or whatever. Uh -huh. So we're all curious. There are these weird trends. It's almost like comedy where you can't really do the same thing again too many times before people get tired of it. Yeah. But humans are always going to want a hook. So it's, it's up to us to just come up with interesting new types of hooks. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just Some thought of sitting here talking to you like in a video if I were just like scrolling through my feed, like on Instagram reels, let's say, you know, I see all these hooks because I get served so many damned ads. I see a lot of hooks and they're all like, you know, the standard kind of hooks or whatever, like goofy spectacles or whatever. I think I would pause and watch if somebody looked really unprepared and confused and like messed up the video, like, oh shit, what, what did I just do? What did I do wrong or whatever? And like they're fumbling with the camera or whatever. I think I would stop. I think I would keep watching because I'm like, oh, I never see this. I always see these perfectly slick, you know, guy doing magic tricks, you know, some special <laughs> effect or something. I think I'd be really interested in like the opposite end of that spectrum. That goes into cool. outrageous marketing as you, you say you advocate for that, like going against the grain, doing something a little bit different, being, right. you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be controversial, but it can be controversial just with a format and a method. I was just at a university earlier where they were talking about marketing and one of the 
young girl she's probably like 28 but i'm like that young girl um she asked a really good question about balancing production with uh humanity and building connection with people through social where it doesn't feel like they're so far off at a distance but as a creator you also want to put well-produced shit out there you know right so figuring out you know how how to balance that's interesting but i never thought about i'm probably gonna freaking do this scott you're gonna see it on the internet sometime but producing imperfection right or taking outtakes where you're really being yourself you're really having a, a vulnerable moment and use that as the hook you know why not one other thing that y'all did with your marketing is you gave away the newspaper at the very beginning and i heard on founders podcast red bull did something similar they used their marketing budget at the very very beginning to give away free samples and i'm like that's so genius but then when i think about being a creator where my stuff's free out there anyway podcasts videos all this stuff how does someone like me replicate that idea of giving people samples or, or, or does that just not work as a for a content creator Oh, it totally works. You know, you're familiar with like the lead magnet, you know, like the free thing that people can get. That's the same principle. It's like give people something for free for as long as you can, but always have like a second tier thing that they can buy if they want, you know, Mm. so that you build your audience by giving away the free stuff. Okay. And then more audience you build you're always going to have a pretty consistent percentage of that audience that's going to want to go deeper with you and going to want to buy stuff. So the bigger your free audience gets, the bigger that percentage of buyers gets. And pretty soon you're making a a comfortable living in what feels like giving stuff away. You know, that's kind of the prince. And I have a hard time convincing creatives to do that. Why? On Amazon, you really can't self-publish books unless you're giving away a lot of books. It's the best way to get any kind of traction. And, but I talk to people who are working on a book and they're putting it out there. The concept of giving away the book is just so foreign to them. No, no, I want to make money. I want to sell the book. And I'm like, you don't get it. You have to give away the book to sell the book. You know, when every time I do a book, I give away hundreds of copies, as many copies as I possibly can, because that generates reviews. It generates social media posts about it. Builds the numbers up on Amazon. It helps the algorithm, you know. So, a certain percentage of those people are always going to buy it. You know, you're just never going to get there. People will sell three books on Amazon because they never give any away. They upload the book. They might email their list about it too and say, "Hey, I got a new book." You're not offering anything free. You're just saying, "Hey, I got a new book. Go buy it." Tiny percentage of people are going to do that. But if you say, "Hey, here's something for free," uh, and then you give them a free thing, and then when you send them a little thank you note for checking out your free thing, tell them, Hey, I also have this whole book, you know, check it out there. Now they have that reciprocity thing. We're getting into such marketing talk now where they're going to feel like, Oh, you gave me something free. I'll go check out your book. You know, but how do, and I know we're getting close to time. I'm watching it, but you know, people say, well, people don't value what they don't pay for. How do you combat that? I think that is true for certain things, but as long as you approach your, your free stuff, with the attitude that, okay, I have something that's more valuable that's for money, then you're good. You know, you decide what that value is. You decide how, you know, immersive, how how amazing your free thing is. And honestly, the more amazing it is, the more wealth of material that people get for free, the more likely they're going to be a fan and they're going to want to buy stuff, you know? Yeah. So it doesn't really behoove you to use AI to create a bunch of free stuff and then People get it and they're like, eh, you know, they want to know you're the genuine article because you're giving away some really good stuff. Preach, preach. Well, I'll tell you what, this was just a freaking honor to get to meet you and talk to you. You're brilliant. I've learned so much from you already and I'm going to learn from you more because apparently you have a writer's room that Heather was not aware of and that (laughs) I will be joining. I, I do a terrible job of communicating to people the services that I offer. It's all good. It's all good. I need to get better. better. A final question I ask all my guests, but before then, where would you like to direct our listeners to? Oh, I think the best place to find me is on Substack. If you search for Scott Ticker's Substack, like I said, I post daily, a daily essay about creativity, 
Uh, a lot of it is on comedy, but it's like inspiration, motivation, tips, and it's free. So talk about the the value of the free thing. How about a free daily newsletter with tips and inspiration? You can't go wrong. You can't there you go. go. There you yeah. go. That'll be linked in the show notes. Very last question, Scott Dickers. What is something that you are deeply questioning right now in this season of your life? And it can be something really serious and deep, or it could be something like, why does Taco Bell have breakfast burritos? What am I questioning? Deeply questioning right now that you do not have the answer to right now. All right. I'll share this thing. So I made a short film with a, a buddy from high school when I was like 19, 18 or 19. And it's like a black and white Super 8 movie, 15 minutes long. And it's fun and funny. You know, we had a, we had a few laughs or whatever. I had the notion yesterday, actually, of a sequel of like a a big budget, <laughs> big budget sequel to that movie. And I texted him about it, shared it, and I could tell he liked it as well, thought it was very funny. And so now I'm questioning, should I do that? Should I actually do that? What a crazy thing to do, to do a sequel for a student film, basically, that nobody ever saw, nobody knows about just because it would be really fun for us. It'd be a lot of work. Like making movies is no no laughing matter. You, nothing to sneeze at. So still haven't decided if I would do it. But I I honestly think if he were to text me back and say, yeah, I, I want to do that. I think we should do that. I would be hard pressed to say no. I think you should put it that through the Ideatron 500 or whatever you called it. Well, the Ideatron, the Ideatron 9000. Don't undersell me. It's 9000. The 500 was an earlier model that wasn't as good. The ideas <laughs> weren't as good. That's not really for deciding whether to do A or B. It's not really an A-B tester. Yeah. It's for coming up with original ideas yeah. from well, scratch. When you come out with that book, I'm going to ask you back on again to discuss that. Thank you, Scott, Thank you. for your time. It was just really cool connecting with you. Absolutely. Thank you. Great to meet you as well, Heather, and, and good luck with everything. Thank you.